Okay, we've got a good number of folks joining. So let's go ahead and get started this morning. Um, welcome to the Texas Water Conservation Scorecard webinar. We're so excited to have you all joining us this morning. My name is Jennifer Walker and we'll do introductions with our team in a second. For today's webinar, we're going to focus on the methodology that we used to produce the scorecard and the results that we have found. We hope that you've had a chance to check out the scorecard online already. If not, you will have a deeper understanding of our approach and what goes in to utility score at the end of this presentation. Next slide. This is the agenda for our presentation today. We're gonna to go over logistics, talk a little bit about the Living Waters Project, dig into the methodology and key findings and um, our recommendations. And then of course, the best part, um, Q&A with you all. So let's, okay, logistics. So you all are probably pretty used to Zoom by now, but here's a few logistics for this webinar. Uh, the webinar will be 60 minutes in time. We'll have Q&A at the end. If you have questions, please submit them through the Q&A function at the bottom center of the screen. Teal will be monitoring these and queuing up your questions and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. And this webinar is being recorded. A recording of the slides will be posted online and at texaslivingwaters.org. Next slide. So let me introduce you to our speakers today. Ken Kramer is a water resources chair for the Lone Star chapter of the Sierra Club. He is the lead author of our written report. Jennifer Walker is, that's me. Um, I'm the deputy director for the Texas Coast and Water Program at National Wildlife Federation. I managed uh, the development of this project. Megan Bach is a senior analyst at Aqueous. She and her team were responsible for the data collection and analysis for the scorecard. Behind the scenes, we have Teal Harrison, Shell Rumor, and Sapna Mulkey helping out, making sure your questions are getting queued up and answered and that things are running smoothly. So thanks to them. Next. We had a great team working to produce the scorecard, but we didn't do it alone. The production of the 2020 Texas Water Conservation Scorecard was made possible through the generous support of the Meadows Foundation. Thank you to the Meadows Foundation for your support for this project and for so many other endeavors that we do. We would also like to acknowledge the staff of the Texas Water Development Board and the Texas Commission on Environmental Equality for their patience with our numerous inquiries and requests for public documents. We appreciate you. Next slide. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about our project. The Texas Living Waters Project is a collaboration of four conservation groups. We are National Wildlife Federation, the Lone Star Chapter of the Sierra Club, Galveston Bay Foundation, and the Hill Country Alliance. We are working together to ensure that we have water in the future for thriving communities and abundant fish and wildlife habitat. We have three major programmatic areas that we focus on, water for wildlife, climate resilience, and urban water management. Urban water management and fish and wildlife habitat protection are strongly connected. We will not be able to meet the needs, the water needs of all Texans, this includes both people and the environment, unless we can do all we can to use water efficiently in our communities. We offer the Texas Water Conservation Scorecard to help inspire and educate utilities in that effort. Next. The Texas Water Conservation Scorecard is an in-depth analysis and ranking of the water conservation efforts of 356 Texas public water utility efforts. We are evaluating utilities largely on their level of effort and not the amount of water saved. Next. All the data we used for our analysis comes from publicly available and largely utility reported data. Since each water utility is unique, we have tried to go beyond just the numerical scoring and provide additional context for the efforts of Texas's 40 large utilities, those with over 100,000 population. For each of these utilities, we have also prepared a written narrative that goes into a little more depth about the utility's water supply, specific conditions, and water conservation actions. So we're going to go ahead and dig into the methodology, and Megan is going to take over. Thanks, Jennifer. All right. So yeah, in terms of the methodology, as um, Jennifer mentioned, you know, we looked at uh, all you know publicly available data, whether that be 
um, reporting that was submitted by the utilities um, to the Texas Water Development Board, um, as well as um, information that they provided on their website. And so our analysis, um, our, the threshold for what which utilities that we looked at um, were basically all utilities that had 3,300 connections or more. And the reason for that is, you know, utilities with 3,300 connections or more are required to submit um, annual water loss uh, audits as well as five-year water conservation plans in addition to the annual um, reporting on the implementation of those plans. And so uh, in total, we had 356 uh, utilities that we looked at for this scorecard, which did increase um, from the prior scorecard, which looked at approximately 305. So that's because, you know, the number of uh, the populations that these utilities served has, you know, increased over the last couple of years. Um, so that the number of utilities that we looked at also increased. And so within the 356 utilities that we looked at, um, we broke it out into medium and large utilities, which were utilities that had uh, served populations 25,000 uh, or greater. And for those, they were um, evaluated on a total of 10 metrics um, and could score possible uh, 100 points overall. Uh, for small utilities, those were any utilities who served populations uh, less than 25,000. They were um, evaluated on six of those 10 metrics and could receive a total of 55 points possible. So, for example, some of the, the metrics that, that didn't apply to small utilities were, um, you know, whether or not they uh, reached the goal that they had set out in their prior water conservation plan, um, as well as whether or not they uh, set strong um, five-year goals in their current water conservation plan, as well as whether or not they um, had implemented outdoor watering restrictions. Next slide. So overall, this is the criteria that we looked at. Um, so we looked at compliance with water conservation planning. So that basically entails the, the five-year water conservation plan that uh, these utilities were required to provide to the Water Development Board, along with uh, compliance with reporting. Um, so that included you know, the annual water loss audit that utilities uh, submit, um, which, you know, since we released the scorecard has, um, you know, there's requirements by the board now for training on submitting that water loss audit. Um, reporting also does include the annual reporting um, that utilities are required to submit uh, on the implementation of their water conservation plans, where they highlight, you know, their, the BMP that they've um, been, have been implemented, as well, as well as, you know, their current water use and uh, other things like that. Um, we also looked at, um, you know, comparing their prior uh, water conservation plan and their current water, water conservation plan, whether or not they met the targets that they had set out previously. Um, and then we also looked at their um, current water conservation plan and whether or not they set strong conservation goals for their five-year targets. Um, and then we uh, looked at mandatory outdoor watering limitations, such as time of day restrictions, um, you know, a number of day uh, restrictions, you know, once per day or once per week restrictions or twice per week restrictions. Um, so that apply, you know, to the large, medium sized utilities. And lastly, we looked at, um, you know, the, the rate that these utilities were um, uh, charging and whether or not. It uh, uh, reflected, you know, conservation-based pricing um, that, you know, incentivize more efficient use of water. Next slide. So in the course of our analysis, you know, there were a number of limitations that we did encounter. Uh, for instance, you know, inconsistent reporting. So especially with, you know, the water conservation plans, um, there was a wide variety uh, of, you know, the the thoroughness, or I guess the the um, how much information um, that each utility detailed in their water conservation plan. Um, uh, so that was definitely a big, uh, big item. Uh, there's also lack of reporting. So basically, if uh, utilities not submit their water conservation plan or their annual report, um, you know, not only do they not receive points for submitting, but then there are subsequent question, you know, criteria that uh, are uh, informed by that. So, you know, do they meet their um, five-year goal? Um, so if they didn't submit their water conservation plan, they didn't receive any points, you know, or, or their water loss percentage if they didn't submit their, their water loss audit. And then last, another um, limitation we encounter, which is the timing and nature of reporting. So, of course, you know, there's a lag time 
for when these reports are submitted to the board and then you know the board has to review um, and confirm that uh, that data before they can send to us so there's you know some lag time uh, in that as well next slide so here um, Ken um, I believe is going to be uh, going out uh, starting off with the, the key findings that we found in our uh, the 2020 scorecard Actually, that's going to be Jennifer doing this next couple of slides. Um, so our first three questions sit around the reporting that utilities are required to submit. The water conservation plans are required to be submitted every five years. The most recent plan was due on May 2019 and utilities received five points if they submitted their plan. The submittal rate for water conservation plans is basically unchanged when comparing the 2016 scorecard to the 2020 scorecard. Water conservation plans are important. This is where water utilities lay out their conservation goals for the next five and 10 years and where they describe the programs that they will implement to meet those goals. We use the data reported in these plans to look at several of the metrics in the water conservation scorecard. Next slide. The next report that utilities are responsible to turn in is an annual report, and it's the annual water conservation implementation um, report. Utilities with 3,300 connections or more are required to submit water conservation implementation reports annually. About 20% of the 356 utilities that we evaluated for the 2020 scorecard did not submit their required annual reports. The purpose of the annual report is to evaluate an entity's progress in implementing programs to achieve water conservation targets and goals. The data in this report can be helpful in tracking the efficacy of water conservation programs on an annual basis and thus useful for evaluating program successes and needs. Um, one interesting caveat is that 47% of all Texas utilities have submitted their water conservation implementation report every year since we began tracking this data for our scorecard since 2016. Utilities that submit this report receive five points on the scorecard. So next, so this now water loss audits. Utilities with 3,300 connections or more are also required to submit water loss audits. Um, almost all utilities submit their report, submitted their report in May 2019, which is great. However, 30% of the audits were removed by the Texas Water Development Board for suspected data errors or other issues. So while the reporting, uh, the number of utilities submitting the reports have gone up, uh, the number of reports that were removed by the Water Development Board were, um, have gone up as well. The top three reasons water loss audits were submitted in May that were submitted in May 2019 were removed are an infrastructure leak index or ILI of less than one, an ILI greater than 10, and or negative or zero total water loss. There's a list of nine reasons that uh, the Water Development Board supplied to us as reasons why the reports may be removed. So there is an emphasis on this reporting mechanism and trainings that the board is doing. Um, this is a complicated report. So this is definitely an area that we'll have some recommendations about later. Uh, Ken is going to be the next speaker and take the next couple slides. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, five of the 10 criteria that we use to evaluate the large and medium-sized utilities. Uh, and one of those criteria, best management practices, which we'll get to in a minute, uh, were among the criteria used for evaluating the uh, small utilities. Uh, the first uh, criterion that I'll discuss is online public accessibility of water conservation uh, information and water conservation plans. Uh, this criteria is important uh, because we're very interested in making sure that utilities are transparent uh, to their customers, their ratepayers, and others uh, about what they are doing on water conservation and also are helping their customers uh, to be able to achieve uh, conservation in their own homes and businesses. And so this particular uh, evaluation metric uh, looked at uh, two different things. 
One, whether or not the utility made their uh, water conservation plan, which they are required to uh, revise and, and resubmit every five years, available online uh, to their customers and other members of the public. Uh, and then the other part of the metric was whether or not the utility uh, provided general water conservation information, let's say tips uh, to customers about how they might uh, reduce their use of water or use water more efficiently. Uh, the results on this metric were a little bit mixed in our most recent scorecard. Uh, unfortunately, the percentage of utilities that make their water conservation plans available online uh, has decreased. Uh, in 2016, uh, our original scorecard found that uh, about half of utilities made their water conservation plans uh, accessible to the public on their utility website or city website. Uh, but unfortunately, that percentage uh, dropped uh, in the most recent scorecard to about 32%. Uh, and that's um, a little bit disturbing to us because we think that even though most people may not want to go to the detail of looking at each utility or their utilities water conservation plan, uh, we think it's important that people have the opportunity uh, to see what their utilities have committed to do uh, in reducing per capita water consumption and taking other steps to be more efficient in the use of water that their ratepayers, their customers are paying for. Uh, on the other hand, the bright spot is that 75% of utilities, according to our most recent evaluation, uh, put some form of water conservation information on their website uh, so that customers have access to those uh, ideas or suggestions about how to use water more efficiently. Uh, and uh, that level of information, of course, varies considerably among the utilities, but the fact that they take the step of trying to provide some information to their customers on how to save water or be more efficient uh, is a very bright spot. Uh, next slide. Uh, another one of the metrics we used in the scorecard evaluation was whether or not the utility had met or exceeded uh, their five-year water conservation goal as established by themselves in their water conservation plan. Now, again, this was a metric used only to evaluate the large and medium-sized utilities because um, actually finding out this information uh, really requires going to uh, the water conservation plan, most recent one, and seeing what it reports about achieving goals in the past. And so it's a pretty big chore to try to evaluate and look at all these water conservation plans. And that's why we limited it to large and medium sized utilities. Uh, we found that um, between uh, 2009 and 2014, in our uh, original scorecard, that about 60% of the medium and large sized utilities met or exceeded uh, their goals for their water use reductions as established in their 2009 water conservation plans. Uh, fortunately, in our most recent evaluation, that uh, percentage has gone up uh, between 2015 and 2019, the years for which uh, they were reporting data in their most recent water conservation plans. 66% uh, of medium or large size utilities met or exceeded their goals for water use reduction. Um, now, obviously, the goals are set by the utilities themselves. In some cases, those goals were fairly ambitious. In other situations, uh, they were not ambitious at all. What we were looking at in this metric was simply whether or not the utility met the goal that they had set for themselves. Uh, and this is primarily related to per capita water use reduction. So uh, it's a positive that uh, a large percentage of the medium uh, and large utilities actually met those goals. Next slide. Uh, the other side of the coin, though, uh, is that 
in the most recent water conservation plans, utilities again have to set five year and 10 year targets for reducing per capita water consumption and uh, things like reducing uh, water loss per capita. Uh, and so we have to look at in the new uh, revised water conservation plans that were required to be submitted largely in 2019. Uh, did the utility set strong goals, uh, ambitious goals for reducing uh, per capita water consumption? Uh, have they already achieved uh, very uh, impressive uh, low per capita water consumption? Uh, or what, what was the situation? Uh, so this was a metric that was a little more complex because uh, it actually factored in uh, at least three things. First of all, what uh, per capita water consumption had already been achieved by the utility. Uh, depending upon that, uh, what goal did they set for the future? Was it an ambitious goal in terms of uh, the actual number of gallons per capita per day? Uh, and or was it ambitious in terms of the rate of reduction? Uh, about 15, 16 years ago, the Water Conservation Implementation Task Force established by the state legislature, of which I was a member, uh, set a target for per capita water consumption uh, of 140 gallons per capita per day for municipal utilities. Uh, and also suggested that those utilities that have not yet met the 140 uh, gallons per capita per day target uh, should reduce uh, their per capita use at a rate of about 1% on an annual average uh, to be able to achieve 140 or less. Uh, so we use the 140 as one of the sort of benchmarks for evaluating uh, the utilities on this point, but uh, we also used uh, uh, a stronger uh, goal, if you will, of 125 gallons per capita per day, uh, because that was one of the uh, other possibilities considered by the Water Conservation Implementation Task Force back in 2004. And actually, a number of utilities have achieved uh, 125 gallons per capita per day. And so, uh, excuse me, the result of all this was basically that back in 2016, when we did the original scorecard, we found that 29% of mid-size and large utilities that already achieved low gallons per capita per day of 125 gallons or less, uh, or they uh, set strong conservation goals, which included the annual reduction of their per capita water use by actually greater than 1%, I believe one and a quarter percent. Uh, in 2020, uh, we found uh, to our uh, positive aspects of the scorecard that this percentage had actually gone up, that as um, the 2019 data that went into the scorecard, uh, about 46% of middle size and large utilities had actually either achieved a low GPCD of 125 gallons per day, or they were actually uh, reducing their per capita water use by uh, more than the 1%, by about one and a quarter percent or more each year. So that was a very positive finding of our scorecard. Next slide. Uh, unfortunately, one of the big challenges that uh, we find that water utilities uh, continue to have is uh, the water loss. Um, water loss has been a significant issue for utilities uh, for decades, and unfortunately, it's not improving according to our most recent scorecard. Uh, I have to point out that the scorecard data that was available on water loss at the time uh, was um, basically based on the 2018 uh, calendar year. Uh, those uh, particular reports were filed in 2019, but uh, they're really based upon 2018. So there's a little bit of a lag in terms of what 
the water loss figures may be. Uh, in our original scorecard, we found that uh, approximately 42% of the uh, utilities that uh, we evaluated reported uh, a loss of more than 10%. Uh, and unfortunately, in our most recent scorecard, uh, that percentage has actually gone up slightly. About 48% of all utilities are reporting a loss of more than 10%. Uh, and uh, there's been an average water loss increase of about 3% uh, since the original scorecard. Now, uh, I do want to point out that our metric for evaluating water loss is uh, what is called unadjusted total water loss. Uh, for uh, purposes of the uh, scorecard, we, I think, simply uh, described it as uh, total water loss. And of course, there are a number of metrics that could be used to uh, describe or um, report on water loss. And that may be a topic we want to discuss during the question answer period. But for a variety of reasons, uh, including probably especially being able to convey to the public what water loss really is and how important and significant it is in Texas among municipal utilities. We uh, chose to use total water loss both in the 2016 scorecard and in the new scorecard data. Uh, next slide. Uh, and the final metric that I will discuss before turning it back over to Jennifer uh, is the metric of uh, conservation best management practices. Um, this was a metric that was used to evaluate all 356 utilities in the scorecard, be they large, medium size, or small utilities. And uh, the best management practices, or BMPs, uh, which uh, most of you probably are aware of, are uh, those conservation practices that have been recommended by the Texas Water Development Board uh, through input from uh, what was originally the Water Conservation Implementation Task Force and now the State Water Conservation Advisory Council, uh, of which I'm an, a member and Jennifer Walker is my alternate. Uh, this is a stakeholder group that includes utilities, that includes water districts, includes environmental organizations, includes um, educational institutions that are uh, involved in water conservation research uh, and a variety of other people uh, from agriculture industry, uh, electric power generation industries, et cetera. And uh, we have over a period of time developed what is now, uh, I think a little bit over 30 uh, municipal uh, conservation best management practices that are uh, posted online and described in depth. Uh, on the State Water Conservation Advisory Council website, which is uh, uh, handled by Texas Water Development Board. But all these BMPs have been approved for posting by the Water Development Board, uh, and they are suggestions or recommendations for what utilities might do uh, to achieve and foster water conservation uh, within their service area. Uh, at the time of the scorecard, uh, there were, uh, uh, evaluation, there were uh, a little bit more than 20 uh, conservation BMPs already posted uh, during the course of our research for the scorecard. Some additional ones were approved and added to the website, but we evaluated uh, the utilities on uh, basically whether they had uh, implemented uh, a certain number of those 20 plus best management practices. Uh, and so, you know, for example, if they didn't implement any, they didn't get any uh, points. Uh, if they implemented, uh, let's say, two or four, then they might have gotten, uh, or two to four, I think it was, they might have gotten two points and all the way up to 10 points. Uh, San Antonio Water System is an example of a uh, utility that uses lots of best management practices. Uh, most utilities don't use a lot. Uh, and so um, there's sort of good news and bad news. We found that in the 2020 scorecard, uh, there were more 
people to use that you use conservation deaths or more utilities were using a larger number of conservation DMPs than in 2016, but not by a large number. And the average uh, number of DMPs used by utilities, either large or medium size or small, is still a relatively small fraction of the total DMPs that are potentially available to them. So um, any rate, those are the five criteria that uh, I want to report on today. And I'm gonna turn it back to Jennifer to talk about the two other remaining criteria. All right, thanks, Ken. Um, this is a really important one. Uh, we have seen an increase in the number of large and medium size utilities embracing some form of limits on outdoor landscape watering. Um, the number of utilities using this strategy has increased from about by about a third from a third in the 2016 scorecard to almost 50% in the 2020 scorecard. That is um, very positive. That, that means, however, that the number of large and medium utilities that still do not have any time of day or day per week outdoor watering restrictions outside of drought periods is about 50%. So we definitely have a ways to go. Being proactive about reducing outdoor water use can result in big savings for Texas utilities. Studies have shown annually that outdoor water use for single family homes in Texas accounts for approximately 31% of water use. Additionally, outdoor lawn watering during the summer drives up peak water use, which can lead to the building of costly water infrastructure to meet those peak demands, thus increasing the cost for customers to pay for that infrastructure that is really only needed for, um, for water use during part of the year. I want to highlight um, some of the cities that have implemented these programs since 2016. The cities of Georgetown, Keller, and Wiley are examples of water utilities adopting limits on outdoor watering since we released the 2016 scorecard. The city of Frisco now limits outdoor irrigation to no more than once per week. They've joined Austin in that. And the city of Corpus Christi has now adopted permanent time of day outdoor watering um, restrictions. There's others, of course, those are just a few. Um, one thing to note, uh, we only did this metric for the medium to large size utilities. Determining which utilities have ongoing or permanent outdoor watering limits was one of the more challenging data gathering tasks for preparing the scorecard. For the most part, it necessitated searching the, um, a utility or city website. In some cases, it was more difficult to find it than we really felt that it should be. So definitely utilities out there, make sure that your outdoor watering information is front and center. For this metric, utilities could receive up to 15 points. Next slide. Our last metric focuses on water rates and whether they send a strong pricing signal. Our analysis shows that a majority of water utilities in the state could be sending a stronger conservation pricing signal in their water rates. Only 45% of the large to medium utilities and only 35% of small utilities have strong water conservation oriented rate structures. So what do we mean by that? For the purposes of this analysis, we use publicly available data reported by water utilities to the Texas Municipal League. They collect this data annually. If the data was not available, we had to look it up on the utility website. We looked at the percent change in the water rate charge per thousand gallons when a customer's monthly water use is 10,000 gallons rather than 5,000. If the change in price was greater than or equal to 40%, then the utility received full points on this metric. Utilities could receive up to 15 points on this question. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Megan now to talk about uh, some of our scores that we found. All right, yes. Yeah. So in terms of overall scores, um, we saw you know, an equal number of utilities with increasing and decreasing scores when comparing the, the 2016 scorecard to the 2020 scorecard. And of those that you know saw their scores increase or decrease, they they pretty much um, changed, um, you know, either increased or decreased by a similar amount, uh, approximately like 10 points. Um, so for for large utilities or medium large utilities, the highest score uh, that we saw was 84 out of 100 points, 
And unfortunately, um, over half of the remaining um, water medium large utilities scored less than 60. So they essentially, you know, got like a, a failing score. Um, and so uh, respect to the, the small utilities, the highest score that we saw was uh, 47 points out of 55. And again, um, approximately 75% of the small utilities scored 32 points or less. Um, so, you know, overall, when we, looking at the scores alone, you know, there, we didn't see much change, um, unfortunately, but, you know, as Ken, uh, Ken and Jennifer pointed out, there have been a number of positive outcomes, especially when it comes to, um, uh, you know, more utilities embracing outdoor water restrictions, um, you know, and de further decreasing their GPCD. Um, and meeting or exceeding their, their five-year targets, um, we definitely saw positive outcomes when it came to those um, aspects of the, the scoring criteria. Next slide. So overall, um, these are the top scores. So these are all um, medium and large utilities that received the most points. So number one is the city of Hearst with 84 points. Um, and so the range of scores for these utilities is 84 to 75. So there were a handful, um, like City of Friendswood, City of Wiley, and City of Dallas that received, you know, tied at 75 points. Um, Austin received 80, um, and then um, Fort Worth and uh, Lubbock received, I think, just under 80 points. Next slide. So in terms of, you know, where we saw utilities use, you know, the, the most amount of points, you know, we want to spin in a more positive outlook and look at it as more of opportunities for improvement in the next scorecard. So first off, you know, percent water loss, um, utilities, you know, there were only about 33% of all utilities re uh, received um, points in this category. So they essentially had a percent water loss of 13.9% or less, which is actually the average um, percent water loss that we calculated in the prior, from the prior water loss uh, audits that we collected in the previous iterations of the scorecard. Um, so, you know, we recommend, um, you know, pursuing more advanced water loss programs to, you know, better maintain and upgrade um, the systems to, you know, mitigate those preventable losses. Additionally, um, you know, when it comes to outdoor watering, as Jennifer mentioned, um, almost or a little over half of the, util the medium and large utilities had no restrictions in place. Um, so there's still lots of um, opportunity for utilities to minimum uh, employ uh, time of day restrictions, especially you know during the summer months um, when uh, water use is at, at its highest to prevent you know evaporation during the hottest times of the day. Um, in addition to that, you know, employing the, the once per week and the twice per week watering restrictions um, can get, you know, even more points. Um, and uh, lastly, um, incorporating a broader mix of BMPs. So overall, um, there are only 3% of utilities that received a full 10 points in this category. So that means that they had implemented 15 or more BMPs, whereas uh, almost half had only only received two points, so they were implementing um, five or less BMPs. So, um, you know, as Ken um, uh, discussed on the prior slide, um, there's a number of BMPs um, that um, the, the Texas Water Development Board has um, made available to the Water Conservation Advisory Council on their website, um, and that target a variety of different sectors. So, you know, we recommend incorporating or you know, at least exploring a broader mix of those BMT, BMPs um, so that, you know, utilities can, um, you know, are able to better meet the, the water conservation goals that they have set out in their, their water conservation plans. Next slide. And here um, we'll be going into the recommendations, the final recommendations for both utilities as well as the, the board. Great, thanks, Megan. This is Jennifer again. Um, so based on our research and knowledge about water conservation in Texas, we've made the following recommendations to advance municipal water conservation in Texas and to better engage the public in those efforts. I wanna make a note here, these are not all the recommendations. I'm gonna go over several at utility board and state level. Um, you can access the full list by downloading the report um, at texaswaterconservationscorecard.org. 
Um, if you go to the website, it's interactive. There's a lot of different ways to look at data, but downloading the report will actually give you all the recommendations and everything in one place. So let me uh, dig into some of our recommendations. For utilities, um, we recommend adopting outdoor water limitations on an ongoing basis, not just during drought. A significant reduction in annual and peak water use could be realized in our state if municipal water utilities implemented required outdoor watering limitations. Um, this is just a really important one and one that can yield lots of savings, not only for your community, but for the state as a whole. Second, adjust water rate structures to accurately reflect the cost and value of water and to send a strong conservation pricing signal that will effectively encourage customers to conserve. Any water rate structure, however, should, be, should include lifeline rates that provide socially vulnerable populations, such as low-income users, a sufficient amount of water to meet basic water needs at an affordable price. Setting water rates is complicated and there are a lot of great resources out there to help utilities in that endeavor. Third, evaluate the potential to tap state financial assistance from the State Water Implementation Fund for Texas and the related State Water Implementation Revenue Fund for Texas or other TWDB funding mechanisms to finance certain water conservation activities, including especially water loss control. The board has great programs and great people to help you navigate those processes. Next slide. For the Water Development Board, we recommend that the board prepare and make available model water conservation plans. These should be specifically tailored to the circumstances of large, medium, and small re retail public water utilities. They should incorporate preferred per capita water use reduction goals, reasonable outdoor landscape watering limitations, relevant conservation BMPs, online accessibility of water conservation information and other appropriate conservation and accountability measures. We would like the board to evaluate options to encourage more water utilities to tap SWIFT and SWIRFT, those programs I just mentioned, to finance certain water conservation activities, including water loss control, and suggest any changes needed to those funding mechanisms to accomplish water conservation goals for these funding programs. And last, um, we suggest that the board communicate expeditiously with retail public water utilities when a water loss audit submitted by the board has been removed and provide guidance to the utility in correcting any problems with the audit and improving the water utilities auditing program, um, process. And next slide. And for the state, we recommend an evaluation of potential mechanisms for ensuring enforcement of the requirements for submittal of five-year water conservation plans, annual reports, and water loss audits, and to adopt the mechanisms that are judged to be most likely to be effective in achieving highest possible compliance. Uh, we would like the state to consider requiring third-party validation of water loss audits to improve the accuracy of those um, of those reports so that they provide utilities with the information needed to pinpoint and address water loss problems. I'll note that the board has um, a pilot program to look at, uh, at some water loss audit uh, validation and so that is a really great start. Implementing these recommendations will help promote the wise and efficient use of our limited water resources in Texas and the scorecard that is really what the scorecard is all about, is helping to educate utilities and decision makers and to really support the wise and efficient use of our water resources in Texas. Um, we'd like to now move into the question and answer portion. Um, Ken and Megan and myself are available to answer questions and um, we look forward to uh, having a conversation with you all about this. Teal, do we have some questions from the audience? We do. Um, from Carl Masterson, he asked, how has the report card been accepted by water utilities? Um, I'm happy for anybody to take this, but since there's a, my mic's on, I'll go ahead. Um, so Carl, thanks for the question. Um, we've gotten a really positive response from water utilities about the scorecard and from the board and from other folks. Um, 
you know, not everybody loves it. Scores can be tricky. Um, but we have had lots of great conversations with the utilities about their scores and where they should be higher or lower. And I think it's been a really good education process all around and for us to kind of dig into these reporting requirements, what's in the what's in the data and how we can actually use the data that utilities submit every year to tell a story about progress on water conservation. So I hope utilities see this as a positive thing. Um, we haven't had too many eggs thrown our way for it. So I don't know if Ken or Megan want to have any input on that. Well, I would just add that, um, you know, a big part of our um, scorecard uh, task um, was to uh, hotlight to utilities uh, where we see pros and cons. Uh, and, you know, in our opinion, because especially Jennifer and I, and I think Megan too, have uh, worked with and interacted with a lot of uh, water utilities in Texas over a number of years, uh, we are, you know, very mindful of the challenges that utilities face. Uh, and very appreciative of the hard work that uh, water utility professionals do uh, to try to provide uh, good quality uh, water to their customers at uh, an affordable price. Um, and as we noted, there are some big challenges in terms of things like water loss. Um, we hope that by highlighting some of the issues in that water utilities face in trying to carry out their mission that we can encourage the public and uh, locally elected officials uh, who have responsibilities over those water utilities uh, to be supportive of efforts to try to improve things like water loss control or accept uh, conservation practices like outdoor water restrictions um, so that uh, the utilities can save water and save their ratepayers money. So, uh, you know, I think as Jennifer pointed out, most of the response to the scorecard has been positive, and we certainly intend it and hope that the scorecard provides uh, some data for utilities to use uh, to improve their water conservation programs, but also to make the case uh, to their public their customers and to the people who make financial decisions for the utilities uh, about the need to do things that perhaps other utilities in Texas have done that um, have shown uh, positive steps for achieving water conservation. Thanks, Ken. And from Director Jackson, she asked, what is the most impactful thing your scorecard identified that in your opinion could influence communities to invest in water conservation? Well, I can respond to that. Um, you know, I don't know that the scorecard itself uh, necessarily points in any one direction in terms of what can motivate uh, utilities to uh, improve their water conservation practices, but uh, combined with other uh, information that's out there, plus the results of the scorecard. I think that one of the things that um, might help in terms of um, advancing water conservation in this regard is for the utilities uh, who did not necessarily score very highly uh, to look at the utilities who did score uh, well in our evaluation and see what steps they have taken uh, to actually achieve um, a better level of water conservation effort, which may mean, for example, um, adopting more best management practices uh, that are available to utilities and um, provided uh, to them in terms of a lot of helpful information on the uh, Water Conservation Advisory Council website. Uh, I th think if you look at the scorecard in combination with um, other reports, Living Waters Project has done like best bets for Texas water and water conservation by the yard. Uh, one of the uh, very clear steps that utilities could take that would not necessarily be very costly, if you will, uh, is to uh, limit outdoor watering. 
uh, to no more than twice a week or no more than once a week, uh, which uh, has actually gotten a fairly wide uh, level of acceptance from customers in those utility service areas like the Dallas area and the Fort Worth area, the Woodlands, Austin, uh, as examples of where those limitations and out a watering have been adopted. Uh, you know, you can do that without necessarily incurring a lot of cost, although it is true that uh, you'll find uh, better results with outdoor watering limitations if you uh, have a pretty active program for educating your customers as to the benefits of limiting their outdoor watering. Uh, since we find uh, through the various studies that a lot of people overwater their lawns, they put a lot more water on their turf than is actually necessary uh, to maintain uh, a good landscape. Um, and so there is some cost potentially involved to see maximization of an outdoor watering restriction. But certainly that is um, a measure that more and more communities in Texas, more and more utilities are adopting. Uh, which seems to have uh, garnered widespread public acceptance. And so maybe that's one of the things we highlight in the scorecard that uh, could impact on the thinking of water utilities elsewhere in the state. Thank you. Um, Lori Gelson asks, what calendar year does the 2020 water loss data cover? 99% with 30% projected. Want to take that, Megan? Yeah, so that data is reflected um, from 2018, uh, data that is submitted in May 2019. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's a year, you know, it's not last year, it's the year before, but it was submitted last year data. And I'll say too that that the water the water conservation I mean sorry the water conservation plan the water loss audit and the annual water conservation implementation report we used all of those were submitted in May 2019 or close to um, there is um, a certain amount of time that the water development board takes to um, intake those documents and to check them and stuff so we were not even able to get possession of those until late last year uh, of 2019. So it takes a while for those to go through the process. So that's the most recent data that we have available to us to be able to put the scorecard together with. So a lot of that data that is reported in 2019 is 2018 data. I hope everybody followed that. I think most people on this call um, are responsible for filling those out or at least understanding them very well. So it should make sense. Thanks, Jennifer. And we have questions from Jan Klein. Um, the first of those is, are utilities that already have a low GPCD at a disadvantage because they cannot set strong conservation goals? For example, they have already achieved low hanging fruit. Well, I can answer okay. that because uh, I did discuss that um, metric. Uh, you know, basically uh, we tried to recognize in that metric about setting strong conservation goals, uh, the fact that some utilities have already achieved very low gallons per capita per day uh, water use. And so that's why we uh, use sort of a combination of factors there. Uh, if a utility had already achieved a 125 gallons per capita per day uh, goal, then uh, they got the full 15 points, uh, I think it was, on that particular metric. Uh, and that was regardless of what they had set for any additional uh, reductions or rate of reduction. So we did try to reflect in our scorecard uh, on that metric, um, the positive aspects of utilities that had already achieved low gallons per capita per day and did not penalize them on that basis. Thanks, Ken. I would like to flag that we have about five minutes left. Jan's next question is, can you please elaborate on the issue of water loss reports being removed for ILI less than one and what ILI is for and why it is important? Megan, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so yeah, um, 
as we mentioned there, about like 30% of the water loss audits were essentially flagged by the board for various data, uh, potential data issues or inconsistencies. And the top reason was an ILI of less than one. And according to the board, they have um, uh, a document that published on their website that elaborates on, you know, what it means to have an ILI less than one. And um, there are, you know, two potential uh, possibilities. It's one, they are at the top of the tier when it comes to um, percent water loss. They perform, you know, as best um, uh, compared to the other, other utilities, or it could be a potential indicator for data inconsistencies. Um, and so um, because of that, um, that potential for any data errors, the, when the board flags these utilities, they actually they end up not um, incorporating their their data into like the the average averages that they calculate for you know state percent water loss, et cetera. And so for that reason, we also chose you know if, if their data has been flagged, then we also um, won't um, you know are, are giving them the points for percent water loss because there is a highly uh, high uh, likelihood of uh, a data error. Great, thank you. Um, Aubrey Spear asks, since water conservation BMPs are like a box of tools that can be used by water systems, why do you score cities based on the number of tools and BMPs used? A few key BMPs may be all that some util that all that some cities need to significantly reduce water consumption. Using more BMPs does not necessarily mean a better conservation program. Um, I can answer that. Aubrey, that's a good question. Um, and uh, the way that our scoring works for the BMP question is they, a utility can get up to 10 points. You, to get full points, you, don't, you only need to have indicated that you've adopted 15 or more BMPs, but we do give points for much lower levels of BMPs, even you know a couple points for, for just a couple of BMPs. I um, understand the question that you're asking and you're correct. Um, a, a lot of these BMPs are really just common sense, easy things to do. I don't think that adopting every single BMP is probably appropriate for most communities, but there's a, a good number of them that, that would work. And you can, on the scorecard, get a fair number of points with adopting you know, less than half of these. I don't know if Ken wants to add more about the BMPs. I'll add a couple of things. Um, I think it's important to point out that, uh, for example, among the BMPs is um, having a conservation coordinator uh, who's responsible for implementation of your water conservation plan. That's actually a statutory requirement. So uh, every water utility uh, that we evaluated, uh, which has, you know, uh, 3,300 connections or more, is legally required now to have and designate a conservation coordinator. So everybody should have at least one best management practice uh, just as a result of implementing uh, what is a legal requirement. Uh, and Aubrey and others are very familiar, of course, with the whole range of best management practices that are available um, on the uh, uh, Water Development Board's website and the Water Conservation Advisory Council's website. Uh, and as I indicated, we're now up to, uh, I think it's 32 municipal best management uh, practices for water conservation. Uh, so, you know, basically, if you have adopted as a water utility um, about half of those best management practices, you get the full point. Uh, if you, um, full point set of points, um, and as Jennifer pointed out, uh, even if you only adopt a small percentage of those BMPs, you still get a certain number of points. So uh, that also, I should point out, is not necessarily the most, um, that's not necessarily the biggest metric among our 10. Uh, and I don't really think that utilities have been penalized pretty much for not using um, a fairly large number of BMPs, most of which um, probably, at least for large utilities, uh, would be uh, very helpful to them in their overall conservation efforts and meeting their conservation goals. All right, thank you, Ken. Um, I'd like to recognize that we're at time. 
um, and thank all of you for attending. Uh, Jennifer, I don't, know have, if, I don't know if you have any closing remarks. I do, let me put on the last slide here. Um, and I see that Paula and Donna, you had a question. We'll, we'll circle back with you separately to get your question answered. Thank you for asking them. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, here's the contact information for our team members. Feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Um, we are really enjoying having conversations with utilities about the scorecard and, and learning from you all as we do so. We've recorded this session and we're posting it online at texaslivingwaters.org. And again, please feel free to check out the scorecard at texaswaterconservationscorecard.org. You can get to it from our Living Waters website or just go straight there. Um, the scorecard website is interactive. That map that you see right there is clickable for your region. You can go through and look at your utility or compare it to utilities of the same size just to get an idea of what other utilities are doing. Um, be sure to download the report. It has our recommendations and a lot of other information and data in it. And um, I just wanna thank all of you for being here today. I wanna thank our water utility folks in particular for doing what you do every day. And um, we really enjoy working collaboratively with you all to advance water conservation in Texas. I hope you all have a wonderful week and a happy 4th of July and stay safe out there.